The semi-custom loop Ice Wolf cooler landed in our shop after one of our viewers generously offered to loan us the unit straight from the German manufacturer Alpha Cool. The Ice Wolf GPX 1080 deploys a quick release solution for integration into a semi-custom liquid cooling loop and differentiates itself from pre-built hybrid products like the EVGA hybrid by providing full coverage of the PCB. Not a full coverage water block, but full coverage. The Ice Wolf uses aluminum fins and a base plate that contacts the VRAM and the VRM directly using a built-in pump to circulate liquid through whatever radiator is attached. Before getting to our review of the Ice Wolf, this content is brought to you by AMD FreeSync devices like the affordable LG 29 UM67P 2560 by 1080 ultra wide, which is currently $300. Check the link below for more information on that. And this is the $130 Ice Wolf liquid cooler from Alpha Cool. The unit here is the one we're looking at. The rest of this is part of their Ice Bear line. And you'll need something like this to hook into because these quick releases are, uh, they're basically screws that tension in. You need a radiator on there obviously to use it. So it's this isn't something you can buy for 130 bucks and use out of box. You do have to buy another part, but that's what we're looking at today. We've mounted it to our test subject, the 1080 Founders Edition, which has undergone quite a bit of abuse in the last six months of its life, but it's back and it's going through some more teardowns and buildups with the Alpha Cool unit. So we're mounting the block to the GPU, which contains a pump pre-filled with liquid and large heatsink for the full PCB and backside of the PCB. Out of the pump block protrudes two tubes, an in and an out valve, and those tubes terminate with locking valves. These can be connected to compatible products, again, like the Ice Bear, which is a 280 millimeter cooler that we bought for around $145. And that also cools the CPU, by the way. EKWB's quick release valves will not work with the Ice Wolf, and the same is true for a couple other competitors but we do have the EKWB XLC Predator and we'll be soon pitting it against the Ice Wolf. Check back this week for that review. Alvacool's tubes use an 11 millimeter outer diameter and are rubberized, encased in coils to help prevent bends that would kink flow, and G quarter inch threads allow for relatively universal fitment to other liquid cooling products. You could even avoid using the locking quick releases if desired, though the value kind of plummets at that point since you may as well go for an open loop setup. The base plate provides full coverage of the PCB, but again, it is not a full coverage water block. The liquid lives only in the pump, and this means that future GPU upgrades won't require repurchasing the pump part of the solution. You'd only have to pay for a new aluminum plate and cooling block and back plate and things like that, and then reattach the pump to the new card. So in theory, it's a bit cheaper that way, but that's assuming that the mounting holes are the same spacing for future video cards. The entire unit is comprised of a base plate, a back plate, an integrated pump, which is this part right here that has the tubes coming out of it, and then thermal pads that you have to cut to size a bit annoyingly. We'll talk about that more later. And all of this means that you can actually run this isolated from a CPU cooler if you wanted to, which again, the Ice Bear is a CPU cooler that's got its own disconnect valve up here. You could unscrew it and connect it to whatever you want, or you could connect it into a loop. If you run it alone, it makes for kind of weird value because the block is basically just feeding straight into a radiator and the whole cool part of this, the entire reason you'd buy something like this is because it hooks into a CPU cooler and makes for a poor man's open loop cooling solution or lazy man's open loop cooling solution. Basically, you don't have to deal with the whole separate reservoir, or separate pump, all the stuff that you do with open loop cooling. But again, it's not quite as effective as an open loop setup. So we'll look at all the thermal performance today. The main things to look at, we've already talked about installation in the previous video, but we'll be talking about that again today because the previous video was a blind installation. So now I've got some thoughts on it compiled based on our experiences with that. Installing the Ice Wolf isn't particularly challenging, but it can be pretty annoying at times. The thermal pads, for instance, need to be cut to size by the user and about half the pads are pre-cut, like the VRAM, but the rest is up to you to do. A thoughtfully supplied template by AlphaCool does make this easier to their credit, but it just seems like a silly place for the cooling company to save money when they spent so much on the massive aluminum heatsink. Regardless, not the biggest deal in the world. The quick release system, however, is a little more obnoxious. It's finicky, the threads will sort of lock, but if you apply extra pressure for reinsurance, because obviously you don't want leakage, they'll slip and need to be re-tightened. This is part of the spring tensioning system that they have. It is a weak point in the spring tensioning system. And this is a casualty of weak plastics in the valve, among other things. 
Alphacool could improve this by adding some feedback to the user for fully secured and sealed connections, similar to EK water blocks, which have a clear pop upon locking. Note though that you should also expect a few drops of liquid to leak out during connection. This is normal. We'd recommend putting down paper towels as safety and then running a leak test prior to full operation. Speaking of leaks, during connection to our Ice Bear 280 unit, also from Alphacool that we purchased, we had an issue where the cheap plastic locking mechanism and its spring popped out of the valve, resultant of the aforementioned slipping threads when you tighten them just to be sure. Fortunately, we hold the tubes up when installing these types of things, so no fluid was really lost, at least none to the board where it would matter. Just be careful when you're connecting everything. Getting into the testing, our full testing methodology, as always, is defined in the article in the description below. You can click that link for the full review, some extra tests, and the methodology. The main things to talk about here, we've connected more than just the normal software to read the GPU diode temperature. Attached to this video card are two thermocouple probes. These were used for our EVGA VRM testing. And they basically, one goes to the MOSFETs, it goes to the third MOSFET up from the bottom, and the other one goes to the back side of the PCB where there's a bit of a hot spot. Starting with a baseline thermal analysis, this simple test runs Fermark for just 25 minutes and it's all automated with scripting we've written in-house, so it provides an understanding of performance prior to endurance testing. For baseline GPU temperatures, we're seeing the AlphaCool GPX Pro idling at 5.4 Celsius Delta T prior to any real testing. This compares to about two Celsius Delta T on the GN hybrid that we built, which is just a Founders Edition card with an EVGA CLC attached to it. And that's something we did ages ago before the EVGA hybrids were available. If you're wondering how that makes sense regarding the lower idle temperature on the EVGA solution that we built, here's why. There are two things that cause the increased GPU diode temperature on the Ice Wolf Cool GTX 1080 FE. It's the same video card, the same clocks, but this one, as you saw with idle, runs a couple degrees warmer. The first reason is because this base plate is syncing for the VRAM and the VRM and any other hot component on the front side of the PCB and even syncing the back side of the PCB. So it's pulling more heat in uh, to that central area where the pump is responsible for obviously sending it out through the tube system to get dissipated once it hits the radiator. So that increases the GPU diode temperature because you're just pulling all this other heat in from the card to one central area. Now also, well, and because the liquid is then working harder and running hotter. Now also, same idea, liquid's running hotter because we've got it attached to this. This is the CPU cooler, it's attached to the CPU. Even though the CPU is not really doing anything, it's still generating heat, even when it's idle, it generates at least some level of load, uh, and so that warms up the liquid as well. And that's why you get those differences in results when it's idling. When it's under load, it's a bit of a different story though. As for load temperatures, we're looking at the GPX Pro at about 15.5 Celsius and the GN Hybrid at about 15.3 Celsius. No real difference here, but we do see that the Alpha Cool unit is more efficient at keeping the GPU temperatures under control when it's under load because we're also cooling everything else on the card. Let's move on to endurance testing. This first chart shows the GPU, MOSFET number three, and PCB backside temperatures for the devices. The probes remained in the same place for each test, but I'll talk about some potential flaws here in a moment. We're seeing load temperatures are about the same when tested over a one hour Fermark VRM burn-in, and the FETs are significantly different in temperature, though the Alpha Cool GPX Pro is keeping its MOSFET number three around six Celsius cooler than the GN Hybrid solution, which relies entirely on a base plate and VRM blower fan for VRM cooling. And because the blower fan ties the GPU temperature and the GPU temperature is low because the liquid cooler, it doesn't run that fast. As for the PCB backside temperatures, my primary theory for the increase seen in the GPX Pro PCB backside is that the massive backplate and thermal pads, which connect to the front side just through the top of the card, are helping to better spread heat across the entire unit. This can cause a thermocouple to look like it's experiencing a higher temperature than is perhaps realistic. And that's also because it's indirectly touching the backplate. So it's sort of the center of the transfer on the back side of the card. Endurance tests with GPU overclocks manually applied position the GPX Pro and GN Hybrid about 0.3 Celsius apart in GPU temperature with the GPX Pro again advantaged in MOSFET temperatures. The probe on the PCB is reporting higher temperatures, but that's because we've got a thermocouple sandwich between the thermal pad and the back plate. All the heat is transferring through that area, as explained. Given that this thermocouple is positioned on a hot spot, the 42C backplate temperature or backside of the PCB temperature, I should say, since that's what it's attached to, is still way more than acceptable. It's perfectly fine. It's not like we're hitting 130 Celsius on this PCB. 
And just as a reminder, VRM temperatures can go higher than what you might be used to seeing with something like a GPU diode. It's not the same where 100 Celsius is really, really bad. On a VRM, not such a big deal. A lot of them have a TJ Maxx of 150 C. So a bit of a different temperature scale there for what's acceptable. One final test to go over before sending you to the article for the rest. These are in more of a vacuum. We're looking at only the GPX Pro for this set of tests. This benchmark is with the CPU being loaded with Prime 95 LFFTs, maxing out load at 100%, while the GPU is being tortured with Fermark, also at 100% load. And Fermark is pretty stressful on the VRMs and power design too. This results in high temperatures in both the CPU and the GPU across the entire board. And since we're using a shared loop, that's an important thing to look at. The results position the CPU at about 52C delta T under load, or about 70 to 73 when accounting for our ambient. And this is with the GPU at around 19 Celsius delta T, or roughly 4 Celsius higher than when the CPU was under minimal load in the previous test. CPU cooling isn't great, to be honest, but it is cooling two hot devices at 100% load, which is pretty uncommon even in gaming, especially in gaming. And regardless, we'll talk about that more in our future Ice Bear review. For low RPM testing, if you're curious about the noise and performance trade-off, we've got that as well. It's in the article linked in the description below. And we've also got the noise testing in that article. As for the impact of cooling on clock rate, stability, and maximum clocks, we'll break this down in two different ways. The first is a straight chart. The next is an overtime line graph. In this table, we're looking at the average clock and maximum clock of both solutions when playing GTA 5 and Dirt Rally. AlphaCool manages to sustain a higher average clock even with the stock configuration that's had no overclock applied. With GTA 5, we're seeing a difference of about 14 MHz between the GN Hybrid and AlphaCool 1080 FE at stock clocks, the AlphaCool variant at 1866 MHz to the GN Hybrid variant at 1852 MHz. The maximum clock is about the same for this setup. Dirt Rally also posts an identical maximum at clock rate between the non-overclocked cards, which makes sense, but we're seeing a boosted average clock rate with the AlphaCool GPX Pro, and that gain is about 45 to 50 megahertz. The overclocking results are similar, though. We're seeing higher maximum clocks on the AlphaCool card. The result is a 15 megahertz higher average clock rate with Dirt Rally, with the GPX Pro at 2086 megahertz to the GN Hybrid 2070 megahertz. It's actually somewhat substantial since we're already pushing the limits of what Pascal can do. GTA 5 gives us a 26 MHz increase in maximum clock rate, with sustained averages about 40 to 45 MHz higher than the GN Hybrid card. Just for another way to visualize that data, here's that line graph with an overtime plot of frequency on the charts between the hybrid DIY solution we built and the AlphaCool DIY solution we built. The question is whether or not this makes any real difference in gaming, in the real world. So our temperatures are pretty good, and actually we've got a slightly higher clock rate with the AlphaCool solution over the other solution, the GN hybrid built with an EVGA cooler and a VRM blower fan. But does it matter? That's where FPS testing comes in. For Dirt Rally at 4K Ultra, we're seeing stock clocked GTX 1080 hybrid performance at around 91.7 FPS average, 82-ish on 1% lows and 76-ish on the 0.1% lows. Looking next to the AlphaCool version, also at stock clocks before overclocking, performance is effectively identical. There's no noteworthy change. When looking at overclocks, it's clear that the AlphaCool card has a very slight lead of about 3 to 4 FPS average and that's a result of a slightly higher overclock capable because of the solution. Even though these differences are significant insofar as the larger gaps in 1% and 0.1% lows with these two cards, the performance is basically the same. It's not detectable to the user, at least any reasonable user who actually is living in reality. FPS is high enough on each device that performance looks about the same. Still, this shows that there's at least some benefit from the increased clock rate stability of the AlphaCool card, it's just irrelevant. Moving on to GTA 5 at 1440p with very high settings and ultra settings, we're seeing pretty minimal performance scaling between the devices. They're effectively identical. Performance on the card with stock clocks is equal, and there's no significant difference between the GN Hybrid and the AlphaCool overclocked GTX 1080s. There's just no perceptible performance difference between them at all. So is this worth it? Well, the end result is pretty similar when we look at FPS to other liquid cooling solutions. Versus a stock 1080, like the FE card stock with its original cooler, you can see about a 5% FPS increase just from that higher sustained clock because thermals are no longer a concern. Because the FE cooler will run into thermal limitations at some point, it can handle more heat, but GPU Boost basically tells 
the, uh, the GTX 1080 is saying, I really want to stay at or below 81 Celsius, so we're gonna modify the clock to make sure that happens. These eliminate that problem, so you do gain about 5% FPS there. We've talked about that in the past in previous reviews of the 1080 and of our build of the 1080 hybrid originally. But does it matter when you move from one liquid cooled solution to another? Well, not so much. The real FPS difference is basically none. It's almost no FPS difference. A couple frames sometimes, but even when the lows are higher on this thing, it's still not a big deal. So the question then becomes one of value, particularly why buying one of these would make sense. There are three possible answers to that. First, it's a fun project and being an enthusiast is part way about building things that aren't necessarily needed but are just kind of cool to do. In that regard, the Alpha Cool Ice Wolf is a fun tear down and build up project for a Saturday and the psychological or uniqueness benefit of that may be great enough to justify the purchase. It's just kind of fun to do. The second answer is that because we're getting a semi-custom loop out of this, we're also getting the benefit of a multi-pump system that has some redundancy in the case of failure. So we're consolidating to a single radiator in the loop. This increases the cooling efficiency sort of per square area used in the case, but it also provides a peace of mind in the event of one failing pump though you'd obviously want to replace it pretty immediately. The final possible answer is related to noise. The noise argument here is that you could run lower fan RPMs through something like a 280 millimeter radiator if connected to the CPU block and completely eliminate the GPU fan, merge the CPU and GPU cooling into one or two fans, as it were, and then you end up with lower RPMs across those fans because it's all liquid, so it performs pretty efficiently as is. This makes for lower system noise levels overall while retaining cooling that is still better than an air-cooled card, and that's really the big one and the one we've talked about before in terms of advantages. If none of those three things are interesting to you, it's probably not worth the purchase. The quality of materials is high enough, the modularity is interesting, the efficiency is good, but if you don't care about those three factors, the fun project factor, the noise factor, or you think you could get better noise from an alternative solution and you just don't care about the other benefits of this, then don't buy it. It doesn't make sense for those use cases. The next thing, these quick release valves are awful. They're probably the worst ones I've seen. These from EK, far and away better. And we'll be talking about these shortly. These are simple button press, pull it out. And when you reconnect it, there's a really definitive click. So you know it's connected. With these, when you're screwing them back together, the threads, if you go just one tick too far, will loosen and you'll have to retighten it. There's also the risk where we had the whole kind of casing explode and I had to reassemble it while holding the tube up in the air so it wouldn't leak. Uh, so thanks again to Eric for loaning us this unit to work on. We'll be sending it back to him with some extras, maybe a shirt or something. So if you have something that you think we, do, we don't have access to, like one of these, let us know, might look at it and work something out. But otherwise, as always, Patreon link the post video helps out directly. Subscribe for more. We've got some interesting content coming up this week, including a look at our new solution for robocopying our files on the GN servers and moving them to our NAS and then from the NAS to the web. It's a really cool setup. I'm excited to talk about it. So subscribe for that. Links in the description below. I'll see you all next time.